I know I've definitely been guilty of conveniently glossing over the more invasive aspects of the internet. There's the extremes, like doxing, of course, but I think all of us who post and interact in online communities tend to forget just how big the internet is. Sometimes it gets scary to think about all these anonymous faces silently watching and judging everything you do online and then feeling like they know you. I'm sure most of us already know what a parasocial relationship is, and I already spoke about them in my true crime video. Plus, we all have personal experiences with parasocial relationships by virtue of just being on the internet and interacting with others online. But for public figures and large influencers, that parasocial relationship is a whole other animal altogether. It's no longer you and a group of like-minded, if anonymous, peers. Now it's you on a stage looking out at a crowd of people you don't know, an anonymous sea of people who know almost everything about you and you know absolutely nothing about. Perfect Blue is a Japanese psychological thriller directed by Satoshi Kon, and it's based on a novel of the same name, and although I haven't read it, I do believe there are some major plot divergences between the two works. Apparently, Kon was unsatisfied with the original screenplay and personally made changes to it. In an interview, he said, The screenplay they had written was by the author of the same novel. I never read the novel, but I didn't find the script very interesting at all. So I said, if you want to stick with this screenplay, I don't want to direct this film. But if you accept that I make changes to it, I will do it. They were okay with that, so I accepted. They wanted to keep three elements of the story. Idol, horror, and stalker. Aside from that, I can make any changes I wanted. So we changed many things, even the plot. Idol, horror, and stalker. The concept isn't entirely new. The obsessed fan and helpless celebrity dynamic has been around since the concept of celebrities has existed. But a unique element to Perfect Blue was that focus on identity. Mima Kirigoi is a member of the pop girl group Cham. The group is pretty popular, but Mima has bigger dreams for herself. She wants to shed the good girl pop image and move into a more realistic realm of work to further her career. She leaves the girl group and joins the cast of a psychological crime thriller show. But things can't be that simple, of course. I feel like Mima's arc here is interesting because it so closely parallels real-world female pop stars. Think of every Disney actress turned singer who's gone through countless scandals in an attempt to shed their young and clean image. Similarly, Mima's agents encourage her to take on more adult and risque projects. Some she's enthusiastic to accept, and some that she is less so. There's a scene where she plays a character in a movie that's being raped, and I mention it so that you're prepared for it because although it's simulated, it's still staged as realistic and could be triggering. And I think the reason it's staged so realistically is because it's meant to embody Mima's mental state as she undergoes this maturing of her good girl image. She is continually getting her boundaries violated because she doesn't really know where her boundaries are, and those around her don't care to find out. In this new stage of her life, she's wearing strange new clothes, surrounded by a crowd of strangers who, at best, feel indifferent toward her, and at worst, still. Was a simulated rape necessary to communicate the problem? Probably not. I'm confident Satoshi Kon is skilled enough to figure out another way to communicate the same message. But I feel that way about most instances of rape used as a metaphor in a narrative. But let's analyze this further. The scene is meant to be a pivoting point for Mima's career. It will essentially elevate her from innocent pop idol to mature career actress. And this assault scene is not the only thing aiding in maturing her image. There's also a photo shoot she does for a magazine where she's told to undress and wear only lingerie. The photographer is pretty sleazy, and Mima is visibly uncomfortable with the idea, but she is assured that, without this, the public will never be able to shed their image of her as a childish pop star. This somewhat parallels Billie Eilish's recent cover on Vogue, in which she appears in lingerie and dresses in an old-timey pin-up style. Except with the caveat that the lingerie was actually Eilish's idea. The accompanying interview provides some context. Although it was entirely her idea, Eilish is apprehensive. I've literally never done anything in this realm at all, she says. A teenage pop star bearing all to telegraph her maturity is nothing new, but Eilish has a point to make. 
Her new look, plus a comeback single that confronts abusers who exploit underage girls, puts the onus on the viewer to consider their baggage. Don't make me not a role model because you're turned on by me, she says. There were a lot of think pieces coming out at the time of the cover's release. Uh, for example, Cassidy McMacken asserted, Young celebrities shouldn't be seen as exempt from having varied relationships with their bodies, and Billie Eilish is no exception. Seeing Eilish assert her confidence is a triumph for fans everywhere, that bodies should be celebrated, whether that be through exposing more skin or simply trying something new. Whereas Ruth LaFerla argued, her transformation would seem to suggest that Miss Eilish is content these days to abandon her formerly maverick stance in favor of a fetish-tinctured bombshell look that seemed hackneyed when Madonna was a girl. If her reinvention poses a risk, it is that of becoming just another cliché. The consensus seems to be that the cover was polarizing, to say the least. Billie Eilish said herself in a later interview that anytime I see an impression of me on the internet, it just reminds me how little the internet knows about me. Like, I don't really share shit. I have such a loud personality that makes people feel like they know everything about me, and they literally don't at all. I'm a woman. I have a personality. At the core of these dueling perspectives is Billie's struggle with public perception and, of course, her identity as a public figure. Even while she insists that people don't know enough about her to know what her intentions are or even who she is as a person, the public will continue to interpret her actions for her, assign identities to her. I feel for her because all teenagers want to experiment with their identity and change up aspects of themselves. They're still growing and figuring out who they are. What's interesting to me about all of this is that in the 24 years since Perfect Blue's release, there apparently hasn't been much of a change in how young pop stars, uh, and specifically young female pop stars, attempt to showcase their maturity. It continually comes back to sexuality, to the star's ability to arouse the assumedly straight male audience. Tavi Gevinson, writer and editor-in-chief of Rookie Magazine, wrote an article about the recent attention surrounding Britney Spears and her conservatorship titled, Britney Spears was never in control. Why did I ever believe a teen girl could hold all the power? And I think she touches on some very relevant social issues. She talks about the way young girls, young women, often feel pressured to acquiesce to social pressures, pushing them to act older than they are, to mature themselves through the only real way society distinguishes a girl from a woman, through sexuality, sexual liberation, the ability to arouse. Spears in particular exemplifies this kind of marketing because of the way she was able to be portrayed as virginal but sexy. Yevinson, now 24, goes on to describe her own suggestive photo shoot that she took part in when she turned 18. I was professionally photographed lying across the bed in my childhood bedroom when I was a teenager. I had been 18 for a month. The shoot was by a male photographer for a fashion magazine the summer between my high school graduation and my move to New York. In the photo, I am lying on my side with my head propped up on my hand and wearing a vintage houndstooth romper my friend had just given me, my arms and legs bare. My head is tilted down and I'm pouting with heavily lined eyes and straightened blonde hair. I don't remember feeling uncomfortable in the moment. I don't remember how the location or pose was decided. I don't even remember what the photographer looked like. If anyone who was there told me this whole setup was my idea, I would believe them. I remember that the romper had symbolized for me my new life starting, and it's very likely I was eager to update my public image as a sexually active being after extensively documenting an adolescence where I favored bulky layers and granny glasses. There are no silky sheets or stuffed animals. Still, when I see the photo now, I just see another thin, white, able-bodied blonde girl being sexualized. There's absolutely nothing else happening in it. It's not a portrait of someone with a discernible personality just a pout. I'll link the full article below and I would highly recommend reading the whole thing for yourself if you get the chance. I included these real world examples because I think Mima's struggle encompasses something that often happens in the real world of female celebrities. They are deemed unable to move forward until they break with the purer, more virginal image of themselves, and the only way to do so is through sexuality. This is the trap Mima finds herself in. As a public figure, she cannot control the narrative around her identity. She can only act and hope that the public will respond in the way that she wants. Hope that she can move forward as the woman she wants to be. Exacerbating Mima's problem is the fact that she's not the only one navigating an identity change. 
Remember, she was a successful pop star, so everything she does is being observed and judged. It's like she's doing all of this on a stage with a crowd of anonymous onlookers, and she has no choice but to just stumble forward. But not all of the onlookers are content to remain silent or anonymous. This is where the stalker element of Perfect Blue comes in, through the form of an obsessive Cham fan who can't stand the thought of his favorite idol leaving the group. Not only that, but that idol going on to shatter this pop girl identity that he'd come to know and love. I think this would be a good point to mention that Satoshi Kon never meant for this movie to represent the entirety of the Japanese pop idol world. In an interview, he said, If the audience gets the impression from watching the film that the idol system in Japan is like that, I'm embarrassed. Of course, I did research before making the film, and I visited a number of these idol events, but I didn't see the kind of example that's used in the film. And this makes a lot of sense to me because if you look at female K-pop idol groups, for example, their fan bases are usually women. Um, And I'm only using K-pop groups as an example because I'm more familiar with them than with J-pop girl groups, but I have to assume it's kind of similar because even in the West, the Spice Girls, their primary demographic was teenage girls. And this loyal fan base can be attributed for much of their worldwide success. But believe me that I'm definitely not saying that women can't be obsessive and weird. I mean, just look at the One Direction fangirls. Like, didn't they hack airport security cameras just to watch the boys sitting around doing nothing? Anyway, there's a prominent trend of Western audiences looking at a work from a certain culture and assuming it represents all of that culture. And I wanted to clarify that Khan's intent with Perfect Blue was not an Upton Sinclair-esque expose on the industry. But authorial intent doesn't really matter in analysis, so let's discuss how Perfect Blue does encapsulate celebrity fan culture, but for the West, because, you know, that's what I'm familiar with. I touched on this earlier, but there comes a point in many a celebrity's life where an image change is in order. Let's take Miley Cyrus as an example. She grew up on Disney Channel, let's ignore that she's a nepotism baby for now, as the much-beloved Hannah Montana, a pop star with... (gasps) Double identities, a public pop persona, and a private normal girl identity? The duality of it all. But we're focusing on the actress, okay? She faced a problem that many in the industry face when they become too closely associated with a certain identity. She felt a disconnect between who the public thought she was and who she thought she was. She said she wanted to break out of the Hannah Montana mold once I was 18 because it felt ridiculous. The minute I had sex, I was kind of like, I can't put the fucking wig on again. It got weird. It just felt like I was grown up. One time I went backstage at Disneyland and Peter Pan was smoking a cigarette. And I was like, that's me. That's the kind of dreams I'm crushing. That's how everyone felt with the bong. But I'm not a Disney mascot. I'm a person. Regardless of Khan's intent, Mima's struggle with her dual identities of public persona and private person are an excellent representation of the kind of confusion of identities that many celebrities in transition experience. And while this experience might be uniquely relatable for celebrities, uncertainty of identity is universal to everyone on some level. We often have to contend with the fact that someone else's image of us doesn't line up with who we think we are, Sometimes they think they know us even better than we know ourselves. And if they're unwilling to broach that difference or acknowledge why such a divide might occur, things can turn very dark very quickly. In terms of perfect blue, we see the disconnect here, right? There's who Mima used to be and who Mima wants to become. But who is she really? I ask that, but honestly, it's a flawed question, and I could expand upon that statement, but I think it'll make a lot more sense to you if you've seen the movie. So if you haven't, you know, go watch it, come back to this video once you've seen it and tell me what you think, and if you have, you can just comment right now. Um, if you haven't, I mean, you can still feel free to let me know your thoughts overall below. I've said it before, but I really do love reading all your comments, and I try to reply to, or at least heart all of them. Um, I'll leave a link to my Patreon where you can give me money in exchange for more videos and behind the scenes input below. Um, thank you to my current patrons and shout out to my bougie Pepsi patron, Hariana Hook. Um, you can also get a shout out, a verbal shout out, I mean, if you pledge to that tier. Um, I'll also leave a link to my super cute cherry Pepsi merch if you're interested. Oh, and please like the video for engagement. Thanks for watching. 